Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dimux. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Will, and I'm going to talk to you about chunk encoding, chunk transferred CMAF. It's a bit of a mouthful. That's why I put Chunky Monkey in the title. I was worried about uh, getting sued by Ben and Jerry's if I, if I stole their logo. So instead, I stole the YouTube 404 monkey, because I figure YouTube a little more sympathetic to latency. So our monkey has a stopwatch in his hand. My subject today is obviously live streaming latency. Demuxed is a strange conference, because the moment I start talking about latency, guys and girls open up their laptops and start coding their own solution. RTP, uh, straight into a custom build of Chrome, something like that, and 250 milliseconds of latency. And that's great, and I'm happy. But what I want to address is a, is a general lifting of the OTT's uh, ability to deliver low latency streaming, to leverage the broadcast distribution we have today without necessarily inventing proprietary solutions, which can unashamedly do a better job. But let's, is there some way we can lower the latency threshold and do it with the delivery systems, the CDNs, the players, and the technology we have today? Do a better job than we've been doing for the last 10 years where OTT has been synonymous with being later and slower than broadcast. So when I talk about latency, not, not to get conflated with another type of latency, which is RTT. So I am not talking about the connection latency from the client uh, through to the CDN. What I'm talking about is the end-to-end -end latency, the glass-to-glass -glass or the hand-waving latency. Literally wave hand in front of the camera and have it show up on your device. Now, we always test it just like that. We wave into our laptops and, and we see the result. But what happens is in the real world, there's a production or control room there or an OB truck. That can add six or seven seconds of latency just for censorship for other production delays. So we need uh, to be careful. So the numbers I'm going to talk about in this talk refer to essentially zero production delay coming right from a camera into your encoder. But if you've got production delay, then consider the numbers to be what's coming into the front side of the encoder and playing back. On, on the playback device. So speaking of stealing uh, graphics, we need to give Wowza credit. This is one of the most stolen and borrowed graphics of all time. So thank you, Wowza, for putting it out. It is the latency chart. However, it's, it's one and a half years old at this point, and, and time has marched on. So I've been working with Nicholas Veal over at Amazon. No, I've, I'm trying to come to a consensus in the industry for what the benchmarks are for latency. So I want to work with Amazon, get Akamai, get Wowza, and get us to agree on some names. So here are some stakes in the sand. You may not agree with them at all. We're, up at the top there, we're defining sub-second to be one second or less. That's, that's pretty self-evident. Ultra-low latency, we're defining from one second to four second. You may not agree with that, but it's a range, and at least it's some common nomenclature we can talk about. Uh, low latency is then forward up to 10 seconds, and above 10 seconds, we're politely calling the legacy latency range, okay? <laughs> but we could invent some other terms for it. I don't think you need to be too much higher than that today if your interest is actually in uh, delivering a live event. So on top of this, we can then start laying some of the applications. Voice is undeniably several hundred milliseconds. That's about the limit. We've got auctions, gaming, betting, live sports, and esports. The boundaries are just obviously fuzzy and gray because in real life they are fuzzy and gray as to where these applications should be. Um, it's interesting to lay on top what we get with broadcast today, which is the status quo for delivering to a mass audience. In, the best you're going to get is DVB-T2 in Europe, which is about three and a half seconds. And here in the US, we're a six to ten seconds with cable direct to home satellite as well. Not the fastest and certainly beatable, I believe, by... OTT technology. So here we have adaptive segmented streaming. This is not RTMP, this is HLS and MPEG dash. And traditionally, the latency we've achieved is a direct and linear relationship to the segment duration. So you can see it declining as we go from 10 seconds down to one second segments. But then right down at the bottom, um, you'll see something called chunked CMAT segments, one second to six seconds. Uh, and at the lower end is WebRTC, which is a different technology. I think WebRTC is entirely appropriate if you need to do any sort of real-time communication. But if you need to go to a million concurrent people with a live sports event or the Super Bowl that's coming up, it's, it's more difficult to scale that up. So I want to focus this talk on that lower right corner, which is chunked CMAF, where we can get from one second up to as much latency as we want, uh, but using our adaptive segmented solutions. So there's nothing new in this slide. This is the standard adaptive segmented distribution hierarchy. We know if we plug in 10 seconds at segments like we used to do four or five years ago, we get 50 seconds delay. 
And if we just drop it down to two seconds, we'll get a commensurate linear reduction in our overall latency. But the message is it's possible to reduce the latency without continually shortening the segment duration. And in fact, we can start decoupling the overall live latency from the segment duration. And that's going to be the, the topic that I address with this talk. And it involves around CMAF. I'm not going into the details of what CMAF is, but I want to say what it's, I'll start with what it's not. It's not another format that competes with HLS and Dash. Okay, and CMAF is just a box. It's a box that you put audio and video content inside. You can also put captions inside it too if you want. And by itself, it does absolutely nothing to reduce latency. So we need to make it part of a system and then we can get a latency reduction. What is CMAF? So CMAF is an ISO-based media file format fragmented MP4 container. Again, it's nothing new. It's a restriction on fragmented MP4. And you can use it to, it can be simultaneously referenced by both HLS and Dash-based presentations. It's been standardized by MPEG since 2017, uh, supported by Apple since September 2016, and it's been in the Dash world since back in 2012 because it's essentially the, the Dash ISO-based file container. So the benefit is CMAF has always been sold that, hey, I can stop my, my siloed creation of TS segments for HLS and ISO-based segments for Dash, and now I can merge them. I can basically make one copy of content that I pay to, pay to prepare and pay to store. It'll be these ISO-based uh, containers, but now I can have two sets of manifests or playlists that reference them at the same time. So this halves my production cost, halves my encoding cost, and doubles my CDN efficiency because the same segments at the edge can now deliver a, a wider variety of, spice, of devices instead of contending with each other for cache space at the edge. But there's another benefit buried inside the CMAF spec if you go look at it, and it is this notion of low latency chunks and chunked encoding. So this is a diagram we've also been copied. I traced it back. I think the credit should go to Kilroy Hughes uh, over ex-Microsoft, now living on a boat in Mexico. Uh, <laughs> So the upper line shows how you traditionally encode a media segment. Uh, it's got a MOOF atom, it's got an IDR at the start because you must begin decoding your content uh, from that very first frame. And then there might be six seconds of MDAT holding your, your data content. But alternatively, you can encode a series of MOOFs with a very short MDAT. That MDAT might hold just one frame of data. Okay, but the good part is once the encoder's made that, it can now give it to the CDN for distribution. We don't have to make the last byte to go add it to the index before we, we deliver it uh, up from our encoder. So what sort of benefits can this get us if we actually try to use it in production? So here I have an imaginary live encoder that's producing two second segments. So time is going from left to right on this diagram and we're observing this environment midway through the production of the fifth segment. So the HLS default AV foundation says, I want to get the last three fully available segments. So it would grab two, three, and four. And I'm ignoring any download time in this diagram. We would have, obviously, segments don't instantly appear in your player. You need to request them. But I'm talking about their availability. Uh, and if you did that, you'd get seven seconds of latency, as we show here. Now you're smart, so you say, well, I don't need to go that far back in the stream. I'll just get the last fully formed segment, which is the fourth one here. And that would drop my latency to three seconds. Now it's, it's not all roses because I've lost my buffer has gone from six seconds down to two seconds. So latency and robustness are always contentious. They're always antagonistic with one another. It's very hard to have super robust and super low latency at the same, same time, especially over the open internet. But if latency is our goal, we can get down to three seconds. Now we can improve this by chunking the content, as I just mentioned. So imagine we've broken each of these two-second segments into four 500 millisecond chunks. And I've colored the, I've called them A, B, C, D. The A one is the one you must always start decoding with, because it holds your, your IDR. So now, at this point in time, we could instead grab chunks 5A and 5B. That would drop our latency to one second right there. And I can improve it by, as I, get, as I get 5A and 5B, I can decode forward in time, faster than real time, and reduce my latency. If I did that, I would get less than 500 milliseconds of latency with this. Alternatively, if I can't decode faster than real time, I can wait. And I can make a well-timed request for chunk 6A when it's available. And when I do, I'll also have sub 500 milliseconds of latency. 
What's very interesting here is that you can go anywhere from seven seconds to 500 milliseconds of latency against the same stream. And a lot of people seem to think latency in their delivery system is the CDN or it's the encoder, but the vast majority is actually in your player logic and the algorithm it chooses to deploy at startup time. And if, you don't, if you're a company that doesn't build players, you should ask your player builder for a very clear explanation of what the startup logic is. So we see there's a benefit to be had in uh, achieving these segments, but how do we actually get them from the encoder to the player in the real world? So a typical distribution architecture, an encoder is pushing up through a first mile or an ISP into some type of live origin solution. And this is a, a push-based system. You might say, well, I run my own origin. In that case, your encoder is essentially pushing locally to an HTTP server that you're running. Or you might push up to one in the cloud. The rest of the distribution, this live origin is actually the boundary between push and pull because adaptive media is a pull-based solution from the client. So now the client comes in from the other side through, through an ISP to a CDN who then makes a request to the origin to retrieve the content. And what we can use, which are those dotted black lines, is a relatively old uh, HTTP 1.1 capability, which is chunked-based transfer. So this is where the, the server is posting or the client is receiving data of which the size is not known. So you can't put a content length header. You simply declare it to be chunk transfer. You send the data as you receive it. And this fits very nicely with our need to get the data as fast as we can from the encoder and move it through a CDN and up to the client. And it's also been baked into the standard now, I think, 15 or 18 years. So it's nothing new and it's very broadly supported. So I've been asked to explain this uh, to people, especially to CEOs who have a finance degree. So I apologize if you're a CEO and you have a finance degree, but here's the simple explanation of what we're trying to do. The monkey is thirsty. <laughs> we, have, we have water that we want to get down to the monkey and we have buckets. So we start filling up our bucket. That's our encoder. When the encoder's got the full segment, it gives it over to the CDN. The CDN retrieves the full segment, gives it down to the player. The player fills up again, one segment durations worth of content, and the monkey who's representing the, the, the source buffer in this case consumes the data. We can model our chunked encoding and delivery by a series of buckets that have holes in them. So it pretty much looks like this in the same animation. As soon as the data comes in each level, it's pouring down into the monkey's mouth. So chunk contribution, uh, uh, modeling with buckets is one thing, but what does it look like in terms of actually ISO boxes moving, uh, uh, moving across the wire? So there's three main components here, the encoder, the distribution system, or the CDN, and the player. So this animation will show two races. The upper one is conventionally chunked content, and it'll have a little animation of when the video plays out. The lower one is using uh, chunked encoded and chunked transfer content, and it should win the race. So I'll start them off. You notice the lower run has already got enough data to play back. And we see here a very realistic representation of the type of latency improvement we can get, which is at least one segment duration worth of latency. Now, it's interesting to look at what network throughput looks like, what the signature or pattern of this is through, through a CDN, uh, and actually all the way to the client. So on the top row, we have non-chunk delivery. This is a, a plot I took out of Wireshark while playing some content. You can notice that there's big bursts. In this case, they're every four seconds. That's because I'm, I'm playing segments that are four seconds in duration. They're fully available at the CDN edge. So the CDN can burst them at 20 megs, 30 megs, 40 megs per second. So they come down very quickly. So there's a sharp burst. But what's interesting is in between those bursts, there's nothing. Okay, the player makes a burst, gets data, and, and gets it very quickly. The danger of periods of zero throughput is that other clients that are competing with this client for bandwidth, they make a bandwidth estimate at this time. It appears to them they have a lot of available bandwidth. So they switch up. But the next time they actually request the segment, it's overlapped with another client that's requesting at the same time. Now with TCP fairness, they get half of the bandwidth, and all of a sudden they're rebuffering. So competing clients is a, is a topic of much uh, uh, activity in the research world at the moment. What's nice about this chunked adaptive segmented delivery, it is far more consistent throughput. We are delivering the data as fast as it's being made. So there's, there's none of this burstiness. You can't burst the data because you don't have it to burst. You give it as fast as you're getting it. And it makes for consistent throughput. So from a, a CDN, 
We like this. It's a series of constant streams that are well managed. It's much easier for us uh, to control than a bunch of sawtoothed um, delivery sessions. So that's, that's a benefit of chunked encoding. I get question asked, okay, you're putting all these, these MOOF atoms in there, doesn't that increase the segment size? And you're right, it does. So we try to quantify how much it does uh, increase the size. So the top, the dark green bars are our audio, and that's where we see the biggest hit. So we're going from 32 up to 97 kilobits, in this case, AACLC, and we take a hit on size of, of about 40%. So yes, you're gonna increase your audio segment 40% by this need to constantly supply new move boxes. But that's relatively a fixed overhead, or it's a, it's a function of um, the, the move structure. So as we shift to video, and I just put in two tracks here, one meg and one and a half megs, so we can see at 30, at 30 FPS, it's only about 2.7% overhead, and at 60 FPS, it's 3.6. And if I raise my video bitrate up to three meg or six meg or eight meg, it would fall proportionately. So there really isn't a huge, there is a small um, um, size increase in order to do this, but it's not significant in, in my mind. Your audio track, while you get a 40% gain, your audio is, is already a 10th or a 20th or a 100th of your video uh, bitrate. Another issue that comes up is a bandwidth estimation. So I've got two, screenshots here. The one on the left shows a client retrieving segments that were six seconds long. So with chunk transfer encoding, the segments always come in just under their segment duration, as they should. And this is a client with three megs per second, but next to it is a client fetching it with 50 megs per second of throughput. And you notice the transfer times are almost exactly the same. And that's because of the aforementioned problem. The edge server doesn't have the data to give. So even though there's lots of bandwidth connected to a client, it can't give it any faster. So this causes a problem, because adaptive segmented players like to time the download of a segment in order to calculate how much headroom or throughput they have above the currently paying bitrate. Um, but in this case, the segment download time is always equal to the segment playback duration, and that's gonna give your algorithm the answer that the throughput is always equal to the bandwidth. And this means your player is never going to switch up if it uses conventional bandwidth estimation, and it may well switch down, because usually it wants to see some safety buffer there. It won't play a one meg stream if it estimates one meg of bandwidth. Um, so this means that we need to teach players how to estimate bandwidth differently when we do this type of delivery. Now there's a number of ways to do this. So the first one is smart. This is just a scatter plot of the actual little chunks are coming down. Our segment might be six seconds. Within it, we got 100 or 200 chunks. Um, so Twitch, who I think are here today, put up a grand challenge uh, at ICME this year to use machine learning to say, here's a pattern. We know what the throughput is. Here's a pattern of chunk bursts. Can you develop an algorithm that will predict the actual throughput based upon the, the pattern of bursts? And, and I asked yesterday, I had got results from this? They said not yet, but I think this is one area that's certainly interesting for this. However, there's some, there's some other approaches. So one is in the Dash.js project that, that I administer. There we have what I can best describe as a simple averaging algorithm. So we take, we take the chunk burst times, which, which can vary quite wildly, we throw out the outliers, and we keep a running averaging uh, sliding window. And this is a conservative approach. It is going to underestimate the actual throughput, but that's okay, because the last thing we want to do with a low latency buffer is switch up uh, when we're not confident or sure about our ability to switch up. So this is implemented, it's open source. You're welcome to uh, look at the code there. I have an even simple one, which is Will's side load. Um, so here, while you're playing your content, I simply do a XHR or fetch base request uh, to a, another payload object, and I time how independent of the stream, and I time how long it takes to do it. Now, I run the risk with a very fragile buffer of, of, of disturbing the, my actual download, which I care about. I don't want to cause a rebuffer just because I'm trying to estimate the throughput. So the way I do it is make a very small request, 20 bytes, 100 bytes, something like that. If the latency doesn't change, I double the size, and I keep doubling it uh, until there's an issue or I've got a large enough download where I can make a reasonably accurate estimate of the throughput. And if there's any issue on this, I just back off completely and then start again. And this, uh, <clears throat> this works relatively well. A refinement on it is that you can actually use one of the segments you've requested in the past 
to act as your payload object, because this guarantees that it's been cached at the CDN edge and is fully available, and therefore you can run a test against it. The limit of that approach is it's only the size of the segment you can measure against, and you might want to measure against a, a larger object to get a more accurate result. So this is also implemented, and I hope you know, people improve that approach as well. Another interesting area when we're dealing with very small buffers, so if we've got two or three seconds of latency, we might have a two second or a one and a half second player buffer, is catch up and adjustment. So in theory, a live player has to, make a has to configure its latency at the start, because once it starts playing, it's getting new data at the same rate as decoding it, which is one second per second. It can't read ahead in, into the future and get data from an encoder. So there's one... Um, so that's not exactly true because what we can do is either speed up or slow down our playback of the content. And we've never done this much before uh, uh, with OTT players. They always play at a playback rate of one. And we build up a buffer, we keep our rate one, and we, and we go forward. But what's interesting now is we can start using this playback rate to pull ourselves closer to the live edge. And this becomes necessary uh, if there's any sort of perturbation in the delivery. So here I have a chart of latency on the y-axis and just time on the right, and I'm plotting a player. So this player started with, with six seconds of latency by virtue of, of where it started in the stream, and its target is three seconds. So it quickly pulled itself down to three seconds, and then in the middle I, I caused a, a bandwidth hiccup, so it, it lost latency again, just like it would in the real world, but then once the latency was restored, it pulled itself back to live. So you'll see all the professional players doing something very similar, but the, how you do this logic, when you do this logic, what your rate of catch-up is, uh, will vary between different, different implementations. And there's some reasons you might want to catch up quickly, and some reasons you might want to catch up slowly. If you're playing, uh, you're filming an opera, and sound quality is super important, you don't want to do a 20% catch-up rate. It's, it's, even though the browser's pitch correcting, it's not going to sound great. But for talking heads, football games, uh, especially for sports events, what I've found is a very aggressive, quick catch-up is better than a slow, long catch-up. I prefer just catch-up. And we've built players and, and test frameworks. You can look at the, the difference here and, and see how it affects us. Now, what's interesting, if we do have a catch-up mechanism, we can combine that with some ex external time source that we trust and a latency target. And what we get from that is synchronization for free between players, between different devices. And this has always been one of the bane of OTT. Um, if one more person comes and tells me, hey, I was at a soccer game and I heard the crowd cheer next door, this should be an illegal example. It's 10 years old at this point. But it's the reality that we haven't been able to synchronize this stuff. So there's relatively simple mechanisms now. So I found just by giving the player a latency target, giving it some means to pull itself to that target, that you can achieve a, a pseudo-sync, if you want to call it at the dat. It's not explicit. But plus or minus three frames. Um, here's a picture I took. Three different machines running a simple player, not doing anything too complex. And they're within 60-something milliseconds of each other. Now, if one of them rebuffers, it's going to fall behind. But then it should catch itself up and join the others at the time. These are not synced to each other. They're not discovering each other. There's no web sockets being used here for actual true uh, frame sync. This is just good enough, which I think is fine for most broadcast applications. Another issue people come to me is <coughs> video start time. So it, now that we've decoupled latency from segment durations, we can use four second, six second segments uh, for our low latency solution because the actual latency is more a function of the chunk size than it is of the segment duration. And they say, well, if you're dealing with a six second segment, surely your average start time is going to be three seconds or something like that. And it isn't. So I want to go into what it is, and it, it might be a lot lower than you think it is. So start time is a function of segment duration of the target buffer you want before you start and the throughput you have between the client and the server. There's also an even probability that you're going to jump into this live stream at any point in time. It's not a normally distributed probability. Nothing says people jump into the middle of segments more than any other point in a segment. So here we have our six second segment in time. Okay, and I just, I'm going to blindly start wanting to play this at some point. If, if I start here at about the three second mark, I want a two second buffer to start. That data is available. There's three seconds of the segment. So I can fetch it and start my playback. But if I start at this 
point here at about one second mark, I don't have enough data. I have to literally wait one second of war clock time for the encoder to make that data before I can request it and grab it. So I can't start right away. So generalizing then, if I want a two second start buffer, any clients that join in that red section are gonna have to wait. Any clients that join in the green section can start downloading the content right away because there's enough of it for them to start. So we got 33% are gonna wait an average of one second. The rest, the two thirds, can start immediately. In other words, a zero wait time. So that means with this schema, the average start time is about 330 milliseconds plus the download time. Okay, plus the download time. But that's probably lower than, than you might have thought uh, otherwise. So like you can generalize this into this table where I've got the segment duration uh, vertically and then horizontally different starting buffers because how much data you want when you start can affect uh, your start time. And it's interesting that if you set a two second starting buffer, there are going to be some clients that have to wait two seconds to start, but they're gonna be very few of them. And in fact, the average will be a lot lower. So it's different to the OTT world where there's a notion of a fixed startup time for all clients. We're different now because your startup time is a function of what wall clock time you choose to dive in and start consuming this stream. And you look, if you say my threshold is one second to start, there's a lot of options here that will give you one second, again, ignoring segment download time. So that's the theory. Then I ran this against some empirical data, simple little player against six second segments with a two second starting buffer. I timed how long it actually took to start. The first one was a bit of an outlier because the CDN was warming up, but I kept it in because that's valid. CDNs do that. And I, my average here was 850 milliseconds, whereas the theory tells me it should be about 500 for that combination. So that means that for my ISP, my CDN, and the MacBook Air I was testing this on, that I, add, I needed to add about 500 milliseconds of download time. So that number will be specific. But uh, overall, that's a reasonably fast download time, and that is equivalent to your channel change time if you're coming from the broadcast world. <laughs> so some notes then between, oh wow, two minutes left. I am not even, I gotta speed up. HLS, super simple, or so it seems. Like you download a parent manifest, you download a media playlist, you get segments, you download it, that's your latency. But nothing tells you when to download the media segment, okay? So the monkey has to stab in the dark, download the segment, when you pull back the covers after retrieving it, you realize, whoa, I'm almost um, at the end of my media segment. In other words, I've accrued this much latency just because of when I chose to try to join the stream. So I have two options, decode faster forward in real time, pull yourself back close to live, or probe for the next segment, looking for a change in media sequence or date header or e-tag to tell you when you've got a new fresh segment. Dash, on the other hand, is a deterministic timing model. You should, in theory, it's opaque, you should be able to tell when, when your segment is starting and you should be able to nail it. But the challenge there with Dash clients is you can never trust the client clock. So I don't recommend trusting the clock. That's a screenshot of my phone last night showing 500 milliseconds of error against NTP. And this is a you know, AT&T based phone. So at Akamai, we provide a free time service. You can request it with that URL. It'll give you time down to milliseconds. It is not NTP, it's driven from an NTP synced uh, source, but by the time you get it, because we construct the response, um, it's going to be off. But it's still more accurate using a, an external source like this than it is trusting every client, TV, smartwatch, or mobile phone's clock. A little shout out to John uh, Bartos. He's, he's trying to standardize LHLS, which is the HLS variant of essentially what I'm talking about here. And people say, you're talking about something completely different, well, no. HLS is just another way of describing these same base chunks. Now, you might use TS for that, but you might also use exactly what I've been talking about this afternoon. So the same encoder and the same CDN can distribute this content, and you can have just two different manifest structures, or a playlist and a manifest to describe it, and for players to get equivalent latency. There's really no reason either Dash or H HLS should not be equivalent for latency. They're just two different ways to describe a, a, a source of content. I have a lot of slides on the benefits of chunk CMAF um, legacy player support. I've got a, a low latency player top left. I've got three other players, including QuickTime player here, playing the same stream. They all play. None of them know that they can play it with super low latency, but they don't need to because they just join it later. They still get the segments. Nothing changes. This is one of the benefits. Uh, CDN cacheability is the huge one that gives you scale. So 
The CDN is not storing these individual little chunks, they're storing the segments. So as enough of the chunks come, the segment builds up, that gets cached. So here I have a chart of a player playing at the bleeding edge, and it's, got, it's downloading uh, segments in 5.7 seconds because it's at the live edge, and this was a six second chunk. But 18 seconds later, a player playing 18 seconds behind live, it gets that same segment in 1.15 seconds because it's been cached by the CDN and the CDN can burst it. And caching is where the money is when it comes to scalability. That's how we get scalability in the real world is being able to cache and deliver with HTTP servers. Okay, Chunk CMF and this caching is compatible with all of the major CDNs that are out there right now. Certainly the one I work for, but all the other ones that, that are there too and you'll recognize their charts. A um, lot of text here, decoupling latency from segment duration, continued support for common encryption. You don't lose DRM. You can't common encrypt your, your WebRTC feed uh, yet. Retention of UHD, you can do high frame rate, wide color gamut. There's codec diversity, yes, you can put AV1 in and do chunk delivery with that, assuming you can find an AV1 live encoder, which we don't have today. Monetization, ad insertion through server-side ad injection should still work. We're not fundamentally changing the mechanism of, or the structure of a manifest here. The problem is the, the ad services get lazy because they're used to players having 10, 20, 30 seconds of buffer for live. Now they've got one and a half seconds, so they have to make decisions faster. And if they can't make them in real time, they have to pre make pre-insertion uh, pre decisions, deliver that to the client so that the switching can occur. And then standards based. <clears throat> I mentioned this is based on HTTP 1.1 um, and chunk transfer. These are things that have been around for a long time. You don't need to invent a new protocol. We can use Quick with this for delivery if you want, but it's not necessary. Quick doesn't make things faster despite its name in English. It makes channels more robust, but not faster. There's a bunch going on in the standardization world. Uh, ATSC3 has standardized this. Dash IF um, is looking at it, or is, is, it's the basis of our next interop guidelines for low latency. DVBI is standardizing this approach. And then we have the LHLS approaches. One, JW and OpenFresh both have one. There are a number of commercial vendors. You can sell and use these services today, both on the encoder side, the CDN side, and the player side as well. So I encourage you to go to these companies and ask them for their, their low latency solution. This is not a one-off thing. This is now reasonably widely supported. Now, commercial deployments are one thing, but this is demuxed. So I want to give you a way to do this all with open source. Um, so on the, on the start of the system, we have the encoder. So there are actually three guys in Akamai whose photos are up here. I like with open, open source always comes down to individuals at the end of the day. They're not nameless companies. So these are the guys who actually took time outside of their work to make this. They contributed code to FFmpeg. You can pick it up. There's a link there for something called Akamai Broadcaster. It's a simple UI on top of uh, FFmpeg and you can use it to produce the chunks uh, and distribute them into a system. It won't cost you anything. Um, so help them out and extend that project. On the player side, Dash.js is the other player project I work with a lot. That's Jesus, he's the admin. We just released a build last night, 292. It's gone in a code freeze this morning. Uh, it does excellent low latency, and I'm gonna show you a demo of that coming up here. And that's also, that's the whole Dash.js crew. I'll just give them a shout out, because a lot of them work hard and they don't get much recognition. But we're still missing the server component. So here I did a collaboration with Colleen Henry, Cobra Commander of Facebook Video Special Forces. I think she's sitting at the couch back there. This is under her Streamline umbrella. So they, they have very quickly in the last week rolled out the capability to do a low latency dash through Streamline. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a quick uh, a screen demo of that. So does this stuff work? Yes, uh, I, I'm happy to do low, demos on my actual laptop, but I was worried about connectivity. So here we have simple player. This is 600 lines of JavaScript doing everything. Uh, and we're getting a target of three uh, seconds of latency. So you can see it very quickly hones in on the three second mark. Uh, stream coming encoder in Boston and playing back um, here in San Francisco. So that's a super simple player. This is Dash.js in low latency mode playing the same stream. Uh, you started up Dash.js as audio and video and captioning and subtitles and all the things that professional players need. You can see in the trace at the bottom, we're tracing out audio and video buffer and also the target latency. So it's got a very tight bound on its target latency, in this case, set to two seconds. 
and a slight variation as we go through our segments as well. This is available, I mentioned 292 is in the build. And here's Streamline in action. So Streamline uh, is doing all those components. Upper right, Colleen's uh, starting up the server, it's written in Go, so it's going to basically take the content from the encoder and hand it out uh, to the player. Bottom right then is starting up the encoder. It's that FFM, FFmpeg based encoder I mentioned previously. And as soon as both uh, solutions are running, slow typing, Colin. Okay, there they go. So then you need a player. So it's going to use that same JavaScript based player I showed previously, just the open source one. And it should be able to play the content back. So all of this is, is demoable. Um, I have these demos on my laptop and Colleen's in the house here as well. And uh, it's working, I encourage you to at least test it and, and deploy it. You can always go to the commercial side of the house if you want to deploy it at scale. So I apologize for going over time. That's the end of Chunky Monkey, thank you.